Well, a good Monday morning to you on this May 3rd. Welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here on, on what I promise is going to be a lively show for obvious reasons. I mean, some things are, are, are just assumed, right? Uh, some things are just assumed. This morning feels a little bit different. This morning, this May 3rd morning takes me back to January 4th uh, when Real Talk was, was, was barely born. We were about five weeks in. We'd all just observed the Christmas holiday into New Year season. Uh, Felt different for most, of course. Most of you didn't gather with your families. Most of you had a different Christmas than you'd observed in years past. Not everybody, though, right? A lot of your elected officials, politicians, had, had taken the opportunity to travel internationally. And you were pissed off. And we could feel it. As a matter of fact, it felt like like the entire province of Alberta was seething. And I remember mentally preparing for that show. And and yeah, I scribbled some notes down, much like I, I have today. Just a few. Nothing scripted, really, because I knew that all that mattered that morning was that we kept it real. What matters this morning is that we endeavor and promise to stick to our commitment to do that again, to keep it real, to make this the home of real talk. And real talk right now doesn't require a script. It requires an element of professionalism, which I promise you I'll do my best to maintain today, but it's tough in the face of Alberta leading the national headlines again. The international headlines, if if you count our neighbors to the south, pointing out that the province of Alberta now has the highest rates of COVID-19 of anywhere in Canada or the United States. Some of the rates are double those we're seeing in India right now, a country in absolute crisis. And our politicians, the provincial government, is not showing up, quite literally not showing up for work today, not showing up where it matters over the weekend either, when hundreds and hundreds of people gathered to rodeo the end the lockdown rodeo this might be the tipping point for a lot of people people whose exhaustion through the course of this pandemic has put them into a headspace where they've had enough i'm not talking about those that have had enough of keeping to themselves and sanitizing their hands and wearing masks when they have to to walk into the bank or the grocery store i'm talking about people good citizens who are quite frankly fed up at what they're seeing from their fellow citizens. And we have the emails, we have the tweets to prove it. I'm not sure I have ever seen, maybe aside from that New Year's Eve into New Year weekend, when hundreds of you were in touch with this show about what came to be known as Aloha Gate. This equals that with regards to the magnitude of feedback we're receiving and today's show this is your show this is your voice today sure i have some thoughts i wouldn't be me if i didn't and we'll get into some of those we'll talk to the leader of the official opposition rachel notley we hope to speak with intensive care dr darren markland who's promised to do his best to join us He just sent me a message literally five minutes before this show started, and he said, hey, I may need to bail. He says the ICU is hopping this morning. I am literally running. Our message to him, an obvious one. Doctor, you need to be where Albertans need you to be. He's been a champion of public messaging, of courageous commentary through the course of this, pulling back the curtain and giving all of us a view inside the ICU. The fact that he's having to potentially reschedule an interview this morning because the ICU is so busy, because doctors are run off their feet, because ICU nurses, one nurse to one patient ideally right now, are absolutely stretched, that should be be the strongest loudest warning one could ever receive however hundreds of people this weekend demonstrating living proving they don't believe it or they don't care and the provincial government law enforcement doing absolutely nothing about it you're furious 
And I don't blame you. And today, as we record this show live, we put it out there. You may chime in on our live chat via RyanJesperson.com. Thanks to everybody that subscribes to our YouTube channel. If you like what you see or hear today, make sure you smash that like button and share the link. You know our hashtag on Twitter, probably don't have to tell you, Real Talk RJ. We'll be keeping an eye on that. I asked you over the course of the weekend to tell me how you feel about this debacle, this rodeo as Canada's numbers lead the nation. I asked you to hashtag Real Talk RJ and hashtag rodeo clowns because it fits. And hundreds of you took us up on the invitation. We'll be giving you the floor through the course of today's broadcast. As the Alberta legislature is now adjourned for two weeks, uh, Jason Kenney taking a holiday as Rome burns, fiddle and all. We'll talk to the leader of the official opposition, Rachel Notley, Alberta's former premier. What do they want Alberta's government to do? What does leadership look like to her? She'll be joining us today, and we're going to talk to a representative from the Alberta Live Events Coalition. How do you think the thousands of Albertans that are employed in live events, in event production, hell, in rodeos, how do you think they feel about what they saw over the weekend? We're going to find out. But if I can reiterate... One thing, the most important thing, today's broadcast is your broadcast. I will bring your messages to the thousands of people that are going to participate in this conversation because when it all comes down to it, this is a conversation about community and what that means. Today's show is presented by our title sponsor, the team at Bitcoin Well. If you've been paying attention to crypto over the weekend, I don't have to tell you it is Well, it's on a journey right now. A lot of people are trying to make sense of Bitcoin versus Ethereum. And hey, if your questions just start with the real basics, Bitcoin Well is your source. For asking the questions to people that have faces and names, the company locally owned, people that can help you sort it out yourself, you'll find Bitcoin Well right at the top of the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Who in this part of the country will ever forget the Calgary Stampede of 2013? Think about it for a second. You go, I'm not so much of a stampede person, or I didn't live in Alberta yet. We moved here after 2013, or... Well, they all sort of seem to blend into one, you know. That's what those pancake breakfasts in the beer tents will do to you. They're tough to discern year to year, year to year. Well, what what if I reminded you about the message on the tens of thousands of t-shirts that were sold online over the course of just a few days to raise tens of thousands of dollars for the Red Cross? Hell or high water? Who remembers that? I sure do. I remember I was uh, living here in Edmonton, my home city, and I was tapped on the shoulder by my employer at the time. I was the host of a morning television show at the time, and they said, we're going to need you down in your hometown. We're going to need you down in Calgary. I'll never forget that day because as I hit, and this was pre-Stampede, hit the QE2 highway and drove down south to the country, to the you know the part of the province, the part of the country where I grew up, into Calgary. And I came down that highway. I couldn't believe what I saw as I got closer to the downtown core. Let me remind you, that spring into that summer, Calgary's downtown was underwater. So was Canmore, so was High River. Who's going to forget the images of of the houses being carried by the rivers crumpling as they hit the bridges just south of Calgary? No one will forget that. I don't have to remind you that Stampede Park was still underwater when then Stampede executives stepped up about the third week of June and said the Calgary Stampede will go on come hell or high water. And the minute that that phrase was uttered, it stuck because it represented something. Everybody knew what it represented. 
It was the resilient nature of that event, of that city, of this province. You know, I covered that Calgary stampede as a broadcaster, but I was also there as a private citizen. I remember wearing that t-shirt that I still proudly own, hell or high water. I remember gathering and watching the, the rodeo and the big show. I remember watching the Rangeland Derby and, and feeling so proud of what my fellow Albertans had done, of what they had pulled off, of what they had refused to concede. It said something. It said something to the people whose houses had been destroyed. It said something to the rest of the country that was keenly watching Albertans deal with, manage, recover from one of the worst natural disasters in our province's history. And it reminded us what rodeo is all about. It's about community. It's about respect. When people talk about cowboy culture, you know exactly what they're referring to. They're referring to people that respect their fellow human beings. They're referring to people that respect the craft, the traditions, the foundation upon which the entire sport or cultural phenomenon has been built. I'll never forget the response of Canadians, and in particular, Albertans, that summer. Fast forward to 2021, just this past weekend, we, and by we, I mean hundreds of thousands of people in Alberta, if not millions, are absolutely appalled to see what has unfolded in Bowdoin, just outside of Red Deer. In central Alberta, hundreds of people showing up unmasked with no concerns around physical distancing to conduct a rogue rodeo. But it was about more than rodeo, wasn't it? It was about extending a big middle finger to the government of Alberta, to law enforcement, and to the millions of Albertans that have complied with public health restrictions and regulations around COVID-19. It was an even bigger middle finger to health workers, the frontline personnel in the ICUs, the triage nurses, the doctors, the virologists, the respirologists, the respiratory therapists, the paramedics, the firefighters, the folks that have gone to work every single day wearing PPE that's leaving permanent marks on their faces that's rubbing away the top layers of their skin, the people that come home and are nervous to hug their children, to be intimate with their spouses or their partners because they're so concerned about what they might be bringing from the ICU or the ER or the ambulance into their home. It was a big middle finger to the idea of community people gathering here pretending as though they know more than the doctors just a flu a scamdemic a negligible death rate no different than picking up groceries at the store or shopping at walmart they say it's unbelievable really when you consider the evidence right in front of us Let's set the scene for a moment. This from economist Trevor Toome out of the University of Calgary. Here's a bit of a perspective check. As these goons hold the most prominent event of the weekend across the country, here are Alberta's numbers. This is a a bit of a scene setter, we'll call it. It's official, says the University of Calgary economist. Alberta now has more daily confirmed cases than any other province or state. If you're having a hard time finding it on the map, Alberta's the jurisdiction that is glowing red. Our ICU admissions are at an all-time record high. Our case counts are double per capita the numbers we're seeing in in India. As mentioned, a country in absolute full-blown crisis. Our healthcare professionals who actually know what they're talking about, who went to school and who walk the halls and staff the rooms in those ICUs 
are ringing alarm bells like we haven't seen in months. Yet still, the rodeo proceeds. In the name of patriotism, if you can believe it. These folks fancy themselves to be Alberta patriots, and as far as I'm concerned, as I tweeted over the weekend, this is not the act of a patriot. This defiance of a public health order, this brazen disregard for the health and the well-being and the lives of fellow community members, these are traitors. Somebody tweeted back at me and said, you cannot use that word lightly. I said, I didn't. We've been receiving more emails than we've seen in a long time to talk at ryanjesperson.com. And I'm going to leave some time through the show today to get to what you've been telling us. Like this one from Hope, who says, I find myself wanting to weep and then rage at the state of my beloved province, Alberta, my whole life. I was raised to be proud of this wonderful place where people truly can be what their dreams are. We have that entrepreneurial hard work ethic that was rewarded with pay higher than the national average for many years. We've had the best doctors and nurses and educators. Sure, the province has never been perfect, but it was honest. That's what Alberta meant to me. No bullshit. Straight talk. Authentic. That's my Alberta. You can have nothing here and become wealthy without knowing the right people. You can succeed with your own grit and determination, or at least you used to be able to. With this government, Alberta's become the laughing stock of the country and beyond. The corruption leaves me breathless. Hope says I grew up voting progressive conservative, a Peter Lougheed type. I've watched success, uh, successive regimes bleed us dry. She says, the UCP pretends to be down home. I started voting NDP when I saw that Rachel Notley embodies that. And by the way, this is not going to turn into some big advertisement for the NDP this morning. That's not what this is. If Jason Kenney would do an interview on this show, we'd have him here this morning. He's not even showing up at the legislature, so we know he's not showing up on Real Talk. But this show is about what Albertans demand of their government. This show is going to be about what community means. This show is going to point out and explain why what we saw over the course of the weekend was nothing short of betrayal. Hope says, so so what can we do? She says, uh, for the first time in my life, I'm thinking about actually leaving. At first, I felt resigned and sad, defeated, in fact, hopeless in the face of leadership that truly appears not just to be incompetent, but actually cruel. How dare they tuck their tails and disappear? How dare they pretend to be doing this out of an abundance of caution? I've had enough. I want to stay and fix this, but like so many others, I feel powerless Forget about hopelessness, though. I want to fight back. I want to show Canada and the rest of the world, in fact, that we are more than just a very vocal minority. You know Alberta's premier is going to dismiss your concerns. You know he's going to talk about the angry left on Twitter. Hope is among those that wants to prove that it's more than that. She says, Premier Jason Kenney is a political eunuch. A petty, inept shell of a man. I dare say he's dashed his hopes of federal leadership. Having said all that, what can we, the majority of Albertans, do to counterbalance this putrid, hateful rhetoric? Hope says, I've started the hashtag, we are the resistance. We are brave, smart, wonderful, empathetic people. Let's band together. Let's destroy and stamp out the narrative that Alberta's full of bow-legged hicks, chewing tobacco, spitting vitriol. She goes on to say, I'd like to add that real talk makes me smarter. It engages me more than anything before. I've made friends in the live chat. The show's a ray of hope and grace. I love the addition of Sarah, she says, who adds a different perspective. Thank you for making me examine my own biases, my own fears. Hope says, at 57 years young, I'm getting the education I always wished for. 
She signs off by quoting Edmund Burke. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could do only a little. That's an incredible email. She mentioned that she chimed in using those hashtags I asked you to over the weekend. I expected hundreds of you to respond, and you did. I'm going to get to as many as I can just by scrolling through. We've not picked and chosen which ones we're going to go with. I simply asked in the context of this end the lockdown rodeo for you to tell me how you feel. And here's what you've told me. Wine time says not enough enforcement. Viral misinformation continues to spread. Nothing's done about it. Places are publicly disregarding restrictions. Nothing is done about it. The premier's okay with it all. Do we all have to die or have long COVID before it's important? Mish says, I wish I could be understanding and forgive the willful ignorance of the people at this rodeo, but I can't. I hate every one of those attendees and the pukes that organized and amplified this despicable event. Mish says, I know this makes me petty. I feel like they should be refused health care if they get sick. Biohazard Level 4 says Alberta is officially a banana republic. Former cabinet minister, former energy minister, Marg McQuaig Boyd says, I can't get past my anger to write an articulate post. She says, I'm looking at a competitor's list at the rodeo and they're from around Alberta. There's more spread coming and nary a peep from our premier. Smarten up isn't cutting it anymore and now he's hiding by closing the legislature mike says this truly is the wild west where the townsfolk run amok the sheriff is corrupt and in the pocket of the railroad company that's about to level the town where's lee marvin when you need him Liffy M says, disgustingly selfish is what this is. Horrible behavior perpetuated by a delusional few, but it's disheartening for those of us who do give a shit, especially when our government gives them a pass. Where are the adults in our government? Lauren says our government's abdicated their responsibilities, hiding behind finger-wagging tweets instead of doing their jobs and enforcing their own laws. It was April 29th. That's four days ago when Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney said this about people that would willfully ignore new public health restrictions. This four days ago. Let's take a look. I know many people will not want to take, take another step in, that, in this direction of more stringency, but we must. AHS and law enforcement will continue taking enforcement and issuing fines for noncompliance. And to ensure Albertans take these fines seriously, we are adding additional backstops with stronger fine collection and, uh, res- and actions with restrictions at registry services. So that means if you are given a fine and you're, you're not take, take, taking it seriously, you don't pay it, uh, you will uh, not be able to, for example, renew your driver's license and there will be other implications with respect to registry services. These fines won't affect the majority of folks who are following the rules and are doing their part to keep our community safe. But rather, this is for the people who are taking the pandemic seriously and continue to put uh, others at risk by not following the public health orders in place. Four days ago, four days ago, Premier Jason Kenney stepped up and talked tough. He talked about how people were going to be fined and it wasn't going to be the type of fine that you could just scoff at and tear up. He made it sound serious, didn't he? I mean, they're not going to let you renew your driver's license unless you pay your fine. Where was law enforcement over the weekend? There were reports of a few RCMP cruisers near the rodeo grounds in Bowdoin as it kicked off on Saturday with weeks and weeks of advance notice. They left. There was no presence there. An absolute mockery an absolute disgrace i tweeted over the course of the weekend you know if if i were to publicly organize a drunk driving convoy where about two thousand of us would get bombed you know have a few drinks and hit the highway putting you know not just endangering ourselves but endangering others as well do you think that the rcmp might have something to say about it do you think they might step in the people that attended this roadie are going to stop on the way home. They're going to hit drive through windows. They're going to shop in stores. 
They're going to put their hands all over gas pumps. They're, they're, they're going to send their kids to school this morning. Whether or not you attended the rodeo, if your kid is in a classroom with a kid that attended the rodeo, your kid was there. People are saying, well, Ryan, I mean, not every RCMP officer has been inoculated, has been vaccinated, and and we're understaffed, and and we can't expect police officers to manage 1,500 people on rodeo grounds, most especially people that clearly have no respect for authority. What were the police supposed to do? I wonder... If five cop cars were set up at the entrance to the rodeo grounds with weeks of advance notice preventing any vehicle from entering, I wonder how 1,500 people would have made their way onto the grounds. Now, I'm not the chief of police, but I can wager a guess that nobody would have made it in there. The premier is not serious. He's not a serious politician. He's not a serious leader. He's not a serious person and he cannot be taken at his word alberta's in crisis right now absolute crisis and jason kenny has canceled all accountability for the next two weeks if you voted for the united conservative party you should be outraged the angriest people in the province should be the ones that cast their vote that exercise their democratic right to support someone's campaign for leadership of this province. He is letting you down. He is letting Alberta down. This is what Jason Kenney said in the spring of 2020. This was just about a year ago when it comes to showing up for work on the tough days. Millions of Albertans who, thank God, still have jobs, show up every day, and they expect us, their elected representatives, to do the same thing. Mm. You're right, we do. It's unbelievable to me, the gall, the nerve on several fronts here. See, there are, there are, there's more than one storyline at play, isn't there? There's the folks at the rodeo. We could do two hours on that. We could do a week on that. And then there's the absolute absence of, of political leadership here. I saw a former fire chief chimed in and said, you know, I I can't help but wonder if the police are actually handcuffed here, if there's more going on behind the scenes, if they've been ordered to stand down, like may have been the case with that prominent church, Grace Life Church, just west of Edmonton. They continue to gather, by the way, on private property, despite the fact that there's a chain link fence that finally went up around that Petri dish where hundreds of people packed to capacity were gathering, defying public health orders, and of course, flying in the face of the spirit of what that religion is supposed to be all about. By the way, that pastor's trial starts today. We're keeping an eye on it. So what did Jason Kenney do? He ignored the rodeo on Saturday as though it didn't exist. He actually tweeted a link to an article that talks about how Alberta's oil doesn't get the respect it deserves. That's only, that's one of two things to me. Either he thinks it's funny. He walks with such swagger. He's so arrogant that he doesn't think he he wants to, he wants to actually take something and and actually rub it in the faces of, of the hundreds of thousands of people That are not just outraged. Don't just write this off as outraged. Don't write this off as as over-caffeinated or angry people. People are heartbroken. People are disappointed. People are appalled. People are nervous. There's a lot of emotion that goes into this. And the premier, who's had a difficult time reading the room, let's be honest, ever since he was elected... Tweets that Alberta oil doesn't get the respect it deserves. Day two of the rodeo goes on with the promoters and the proponents laughing at the stir that they're creating on social media, suggesting that it makes their experience at the rodeo that much sweeter. 
how angry people are about it. Nothing from the RCMP, nothing from Alberta's premier, nothing from the justice minister, nothing from the health minister, not a peep. Until late afternoon on Sunday, as day two of this rodeo wraps, Alberta's premier, and this has to have been a staffer, because Jason Kenney doesn't make grammatical and spelling errors in his tweets, and this one's rife with them. But Alberta's premier, it is disturbing and to see. So anyway, I digress, but he didn't write this. One of his issues managers, I'm sure, did. He pays $3 million. I mean, you do. Sorry, Alberta. You pay $3 million a year for his staff. A room full of issues managers that can't seem to manage any issues. Says the premier, it is disturbing to see large numbers of people gathering this weekend at Bowdoin in flagrant violation of COVID-19 public health measures. We are all sick of this. We all want it to end. Thousands of Albertans are following the rules, sacrificing travel, social gatherings to do their part to stop the spread. Not only are gatherings like this a threat to public health, they are a slap in the face to everybody who is observing the rules to keep themselves and their fellow Albertans safe. On a personal note, says the premier, I'm angered and saddened. That's why he waited until the rodeo was done. It's why he waited two days, because he's so angered and saddened to see so many people selfishly put themselves ahead of others. Rodeo is celebrates Alberta's Western heritage, a key part of which is our community spirit, looking out for others, especially the vulnerable. This is the opposite. That's the opposite of what these folks are doing, says Premier Jason Kenney. Well, he's right about that. If only he could do something other than tweet. Can you imagine how frustrating it must be when you open up the binder that's left on the desk of the premier's office when you get there and you go to the tab that says crisis management and you open it up and unfortunately you discover there that your options are limited to tweeting after the fact. How frustrating that must be for a courageous leader like Jason Kenney. If only he could have done something about it. If only rodeo organizers would have given weeks of advance notice. You know, reasonable Albertans en masse expected that this thing would be shut down. Especially after the big talk about consequences, about enforcement about how serious the provincial government takes this because we're in the midst of a pandemic with ICU admissions, the highest they've ever been. And when the jerk that lives next door to you or whose kid is in the same class as your kid tells you that the average age of death in Alberta from COVID-19 is over 80 and the average person uh, that dies of COVID-19 had a number of other comorbidities, you remind them that ICU admissions are disproportionately people in their 40s and 50s. Not that the 80-year-olds are octogenarians, the folks that actually picked the rocks and tilled the fields and drilled the oil and built this place. Never mind the fact that some of this unbelievable dialogue seemingly dismisses the value of their lives. But perhaps it's worth a reminder that this pandemic is kicking the ass of otherwise strong and healthy people. The most unfortunate thing about all of this is that some people that attended that rodeo are about to learn that this is not a joke. They're about to learn that this is not a scam. They're about to learn how real COVID-19 really is. There are reports of healthcare workers that were at the rodeo. And a reliable source has told us that they're bound to face sanctions, not because they've been outed on social media, but because complaints have been logged with professional governing bodies. Confidence in our public health care system is absolutely paramount. And this type of brazen defiance of public health health orders cannot be tolerated. But that's just the nurses. What about everybody else? How many of these people that that had their cowboy hats pulled down low over their eyes at the rodeo are going to be showing up at workplaces today without their colleagues having but a clue about how they spent their weekend? Martin sent us an email. He says, I'm exhausted and I'm pissed. 
He says, we're over a year into this. How have people still not learned? This is me being naive, I guess, expecting the best from people. Something I'll never give up, even when challenged like this. Seeing how other regions and other countries have worked this out gives me hope. We have an ask-in, by the way, with the Premier of Nova Scotia. What What a difference in how they're managing this in Nova Scotia. Martin says, seeing those in our communities continue to fight the good fight gives me hope. We know the only way through this is action. Restrictions actually enforced or a vaccine. And so many have chosen neither. Seeing actions like this rodeo, those 17 MLAs that signed the open letter against lockdown restrictions, the various marches, all these people who think that they're standing up for something and fighting back, that the government can't tell them what to do. It's the same attitude as a, as a rebellious, pubescent child. And I wonder why these people have never truly grown up. These are all the people, says Martin, who claim to be hardworking, yet they refuse to put in the work to beat the virus. They're lazy. These are the people who claim to be against entitlement from others, yet they're showcasing their own entitlement by refusing to be part of the solution. These are the people who claim to be simple country folk, yet do not have an ounce of patience in them. These are the people who claim to be for personal responsibility, yet throw that exact thing away at the slightest impediment to their privilege. They're selfish These are the people that think they're big and tough. They're heroes in their own eyes for pushing back, yet they embody weakness covered by false strength. These are the people who purport to be religious, God-fearing folks, yet they think nothing of others, only of themselves. They hide behind their religion because it's the entitlement that society has granted them over centuries. These are the people who view government as the enemy. By the way, Jason Kenney booed at that rodeo over the weekend. Martin says, in a democratic system, the government is a representation of the people. If you are anti-government, you are anti-people, you are anti-society, you are anti-community. These are the people that want to talk about freedoms, free speech, McGuns, yet fail the concept of living in a shared society. They do not understand that their rights do not get to cause others harm. Their rights come with responsibilities, and their rights end at the tip of their nose these are the people that want unidirectional action that shields them and allows them to do whatever they want free of consequence these people are assholes says martin i'm sure they'd take issue with being called that more issue than they would in evaluating their own actions it's cause and effect play stupid games win stupid prizes but here's the thing says martin i don't want to make this an us versus them situation I'd rather have these folks come on board than push them away. They're humans too. So where did this all go wrong? What drove them here? Why do people believe that that government is the enemy, that the educated are the enemy, that only they can be trusted, says Martin. Sadly, events like this rodeo and others just like that places the spotlight on these folks and in, 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 on, and places the spotlight on a much larger and further reaching problem. These actions and feelings are not isolated. He says, my workplace is great at coming up with policies, but the problem is they refuse to act on them. Afraid, cowardly, feckless, hungry for profit. They put policies in place to show we're doing something, but they never act them out, endangering people Because at the end of the day, it's profit over people. Martin says, I'm exhausted. I can't even imagine what frontline healthcare workers and community leaders are feeling. They have a strength greater than most, and it's an embarrassment to see fellow citizens treating them with such disdain. They and others doing good work in the community at this time should be the shining beacons on how to be and where to go. It's a shame that so many are working against our pillars of society, education, health care, and democracy. That from Martin. We're going to get to more of your emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. I want to get to as many tweets of yours as I can. I told you, if you use the hashtag Rodeo Clowns and Real Talk RJ, we're going to get to as many of them as we can. I'm just reading down the list. I'm not skipping them. Traxy says, you know, for a guy who campaigned on the blue pickup truck driving tough guy bluster 
The real life Jason Kenny is actually as craven and cowardly as Alberta's ever seen. He's the wimp getting sand kicked in his face in the old Joe Wider ads, except for without the happy ending. A dated but fantastic pop culture reference. Peter says debacle is a good word, Ryan, on many levels. I'll comment only on adjourning the legislative session. Alberta needs leadership now, and Jason Kenney thinks this is a good time to shut down one of our most visible instruments of leadership. He has failed, and he should resign. Terry says these tweets about rodeo clowns illustrates a culture and political divide between North and South. He says, I'm not saying it's about them and us, but cultural values in the South are not shared throughout Alberta. Interesting take. COVID it out, says I'm disillusioned, disgusted, it's disturbing, it's diabolical, this darkness, our premier lacks courage. And Jennifer says, and the whole province will have to pay for their health care. You can keep the comments coming. Uh, Producer Sarah Hoyles is keeping an eye on our live chat. How would you characterize what you're seeing on the live chat right now? I mean, if you were to, if you were to, if you, this is a difficult assignment, but if you were to try to take one word and characterize the majority of what people are bringing to the table live this morning, is, is it outrage? Is it disappointment? Is it exhaustion? Is it betrayal? Mm. I think those are, those are all great words. And I think those all capture, I mean, people are fed up. I think fed up is, is probably captures it quite nicely um coward keeps popping up uh in relation to the premier oh mad angry rage it's oh boy and uh, rightly so you tweeted something interesting this weekend (laughs) oh boy you knew i was gonna ask you about this yeah you 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 were you were going through an, an internal exercise on on processing your feelings about the hundreds of people that showed up at this rodeo. Yeah. Well, I truly, to me, I, I know that it's, it's, they, they've demonstrated they are not going to take the, the measures seriously and that they, you know, want to have their freedoms as they dub it. So, but to me, I, and so it's pitting two groups of people against each other. And it's, you know, these sparring is happening and we're all focusing on these, the hundreds of people that were there. And to me, I don't want to be angry at them. I mean, I'm, I'm angry. (laughs) I'm angry at the situation, but I'm kind of wondering, I want to zoom out and look at what is it that drives them? And I feel like the... (sighs) I feel like the the UCP have fueled that fire of distrust for government. I mean, now they are the government, <laughs> but um, distrust for government, um, being cynical. And so I, I feel that they were willfully misled is what I wrote. I said that they were mil- willfully misled and that I am trying to have compassion for them and um, trying to understand where they're coming from. I don't agree with the actions and their behaviors. But I think hating them and, you know, spitting insults and being uh, mean, (laughs) mean spirited to them does not solve anything. It just distracts and diverts attention. And that to me is what I'm concerned about is the diversion. It's creating a diversion where we, oh, if we focus on each other and, and the hate and the anger and the disappointment, I mean, everything that's coming in here about talking about the disappointment and the anger towards the government, it's getting diverted. And I think, no, no, <laughs> let's stay focused here. Um, that's, that's what my tweet was about that I, I, instead of, you know, yeah, splintering, we need to remain focused and, and look at how do we hold the government to account? That means different things to different people, doesn't it? absolutely you gotcha (laughs) megan (laughs) megan cc'd us on her email to the premier we invite you to do that to include talk at ryanjesperson.com on your cc's to premier jason kenny megan says good morning premier i guess it's a good morning for you you're not going to work today 
I'm currently sitting on an Edmonton public transit bus surrounded by other workers. We're all taking a risk this morning to be exposed to COVID while you and your government hide. Shame on you. Our province is in crisis and you choose to run away. Shame on you, says Megan. You did nothing to stop a huge rodeo this weekend while my family stayed home. I sent my son to grade one today, worried sick. He'll be exposed to COVID. Not you, though, right? Not your MLAs. Step up and do your job. Put strict lockdown measures in effect. Move all grades to online learning. People are dying and you are literally doing nothing. I mean, not true, Megan. He actually did learn how to use the emergency alert system so he could could show off how he could text everybody in the province all at the same time to talk about his super duper serious lockdown restrictions. And then the rodeo happened. Nancy and Deanna co-authored an email to us just north of Edmonton in beautiful St. Albert. As a parent, writes Nancy, one of my roles was to teach and model important values to my children, and one of those is personal responsibility. That also includes accountability, facing the music when you're wrong, not running away or hiding from mistakes. It requires courage. It requires personal strength. I'm telling you this because it's not only cowardly to suspend sitting of the spring session at the Alberta legislature, it's also irresponsible. Teachers, healthcare workers, food servers, grocery and retail workers, bus drivers, first responders. Well, says Nancy, let's just say everybody except Alberta's MLAs are continuing to work during this horrific third wave. So just when Albertans need to have our elected officials sit together, literally or remotely, to hammer out some protection, that's the time you close things up? It seems odd, especially when so many of your MLAs have gone on the record to state that COVID's not as bad as many are making it out to be. Premier, you yourself stated it was just like the flu. Could it be that you and your caucus need to lay low until this whole pesky pandemic blows over? Writes Deanna on the letter, you, Premier, would be the perfect example of the face of cowardice, failure to lead, lack of accountability, hypocrisy. If I were teaching my children about values today, you would be a perfect example of what is utterly unacceptable. Cody CC'd us on his email to Premier Jason Kenney. Premier, you have completely and totally failed the people of Alberta with your COVID response. And rather than taking personal responsibility, the creed you love to preach, you've decided to tuck tail and run away, suspending the legislature while Albertans suffer and are in desperate need of help. It's utterly embarrassing, says Cody. You often invoke Winston Churchill. While I'm inclined to compare you to Neville Chamberlain, I won't, as it would be an insult to Neville Chamberlain, who at least had the good sense to move aside after he failed and realized he was out of his depth. I have to go to work tomorrow, says Cody, and interact face-to-face with dozens of individuals, none of us with paid sick leave. My partner, who is immunocompromised, has to go to the hospital tonight, to bravely combat this totally avoidable crisis of your making. Maybe, Jason, you could find a nice lobbying job now that your hopes of leading the federal conservatives have been dashed by your rank incompetence and complete and total failure of leadership. That from Cody. We'll get to more of your comments in just a moment. Sarah's taking a look at what's making news right now. We're going to talk to former Premier Rachel Notley, leader of Alberta's official opposition, coming up in about 10 minutes. We hope to speak with ICU Dr. Darren Markland, though we have insisted that if his ICU continues to place demands on him like it has over the early hours of this morning as he's communicated with us, that we will obviously postpone that interview. He needs to be where he needs to be. These are the Albertans. For those of you... (laughs) that maybe don't recognize the significance of being in ICU, let me remind you, this is dire straits. These are serious circumstances. When you're in the ICU, if it's properly staffed, the nurse-to-patient ratio is one-to-one because the demands are so serious, because the stakes are so high. Dr. Markland let us know this morning before we went live that he is literally running around the ICU today. If he has five minutes, he'll be joining us. If not, who wouldn't understand? 
And we're going to talk to a representative from the Alberta Live Events Coalition. How pissed are live events personnel right now that a rodeo just went ahead? How pissed is the rodeo community that this thing proceeded? We have a, an ask in with the Canadian Pro Rodeo Association who has got back to us and has essentially offered a no comment, which is fair. I'm sure that this is something they're discussing themselves. Said the president of the Canadian Pro Rodeo Association to me directly last night. Thank you for the invite to join you on Real Talk. I have nothing to say about the rodeo in Bowdoin. It was not our event, and I only know what I read on social media. That from the Canadian Pro Rodeo Association. What are the people that provided rodeo stock, the animals? Was there an ambulance there like there should be at a rodeo? Who provided that ambulance if there was? And if there wasn't, what the hell? What about the paramedics that were there if they were there? What about the rodeo competitors that took part? Will there be sanctions there? You have to wonder. Uh, Premier Jason Kenney is going to talk to Albertans today at 4 o'clock. It sounds like he's getting the message that he might have to show up and say something. I'm not sure if he'll take reporters' questions. I'll be curious to see how he will interpret the manifestation of the promise he made to Albertans, which is that they're going to take these restrictions seriously. They're going to issue fines and they're going to collect on them. I sure hope that law enforcement or bylaw officials or sheriffs or someone else was photographing license plates in that parking lot. I sure hope there's some consequence for organizers, those that have brazenly gone on the record, defiantly laughing in the face of restrictions that are enacted because we are in a fight for our lives right now. If not serious now, then when? More of your emails in a moment. This show is presented by incredible sponsors, including the team that powers our hashtag Real Talk RJ. That's the team at Park Power. If you use the promo code 2021-REALTALK right now at parkpower.ca, they're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill. They're a locally owned and operating provider of internet, electricity, and natural gas. You can take your business anywhere you like, so why not take it to Park Power? You can check them out online. Wanted to remind you that the teams of the Dairy Queens at Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park are getting ready to help you out for Mother's Day. That's why right now, if you mention Real Talk or drop my name, Jespo, they're going to give you $5 off those famous Dairy Queen Mother's Day cakes. It's a deal you're only going to get if you drop the name Jespo or Real Talk, and you're only going to get it at the six Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Go ahead and pay them a visit today and make sure you say hi in the drive through Also, a big shout out to the team at Eden Landscaping. This is the type and the time of year where they're getting ready to dust off all the equipment and start building dreams again. They're a one-stop shop, as you can see at landscapeedmonton.ca. So whether it's an outdoor gazebo, maybe a new pad for that hot tub you ordered because you're not vacationing this summer, maybe it's an outdoor fire pit circle, a retaining wall, or something else, that cook station I keep dreaming about, they design it, they build it for you. You don't have to do any contracting via landscapeedmonton.ca, the team at Eden Landscaping. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can send us emails. Uh, that's exactly what Kelly did. Kelly's subject line reads, SOS, is anyone going to help us? Our province, says Kelly, has the highest COVID case counts in the country. Double per capita the cases in India. Our hospitals are filling up. Our ICU beds are running out. Field hospitals are being set up. No one's sure who's going to staff them as healthcare workers are pushed to the brink of human performance. Yet, our government does nothing. The premier MIA, the economy in the toilet, and more and more evidence demonstrating that the only way for this economy to recover is to get rid of this virus and support people. The restrictions are far too relaxed and, quite frankly, ridiculous in their ineffectiveness at this stage of the crisis. There was a rodeo attended by thousands over the weekend. Was anyone ticketed? Wonders Kelly, I thought this was the law and order party. Why were they given a pass? Because it's rural? 
because they're white? What about when they end up at local hospitals and put healthcare workers at risk? What about when they send their kids to school this morning and potentially infect classmates and staff and teachers? Do we just wait and watch? If I hear one more politician blame vaccine distribution or Justin Trudeau says, Kelly, I'm going to scream. I met my wits end with the lies, the gaslighting, the lack of responsibility being taken. Anyone with half a brain can look at federal numbers, national numbers, and see that we are the outliers due to lack of leadership, empathy, and understanding of exponential math, lives and livelihoods, my ass. It's getting people killed. When is anyone going to stand up for those who have been following the rules to get through this sooner? with less death, less disability, less destruction? Where are real measures and enforcement? When will we stand up for science? When will Alberta's premier stand up for our kids, our healthcare workers, our teachers, and our businesses? Yours in anger, fear, and embarrassment. That from Kelly. Danielle wrote in to say it is an abomination to wake up on Sunday morning and hear that Alberta is at the top of the national news cycle again as the number of our COVID cases double those in Ontario and obviously lead Canada. If you look at the so-called new restrictions that the Premier established, nothing's being done. Gyms were close to closed anyway. Junior high and high schools closed anyway. We're being killed softly with arrogance, political maneuvering, and what amounts to abject ignorance by prolonging the agony and refusing any strict measures. The Premier is killing small business with his desire to please the right, in fact, angering everyone while putting Albertans' health at risk, destroying any chance of a quick economic recovery, says Danielle Premier. It's time to go. More and more comments have come in. This is striking. You've heard Professor Timothy Caulfield on this show before, the author of Relax, Damn It, the author of Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything. He, 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 doesn't, like, he doesn't fancy himself a myth buster. He, he didn't prefer that description last time he joined us on the show. But he's a guy that confronts health myths head on. It's what earned him his own Netflix series. He tweeted this just a short time ago. For those that are watching live on YouTube, you can see it with your own eyes. For those that are listening to this on the podcast, let me describe it for you. It demonstrates where Alberta's COVID numbers stack up with the rest of Canada. And it's disgraceful. It's, I was going to say concerning, but that's not strong enough of a word. We more than double Ontario. We lead the country by a mile and points out Professor Caulfield, Alberta, a chaotic, polarized pandemic response, the highest vaccine hesitancy in the country, most likely to say they have shared false news and the least informed about what's going on. He cites his sources, by the way, on all of this. This is polling he's referencing, argues Professor Caulfield, sometimes correlation matters. I think probably the most common theme of the messages that you sent us over the weekend was that you don't recognize your Alberta right now. You don't recognize it. It's unfamiliar. It's not been like this before. In times of flood, in times of wildfire, in times of devastating hailstorms, the destruction of crops and homes, in times of mass tragedy, Albertans and Canadians have banded together in it together and not everybody feels that way right now now it's cliche to point out that leadership starts at the top but it's true our first guest this morning knows a thing or two about that she was the premier of alberta as the regional municipality of wood buffalo burned Uh, rachel notley now the leader of alberta's official opposition joining us live Uh, thank you for being here 
it's good to be here, uh, Ryan. Good to chat, chat with you. We've been trying to characterize the tone of the literally now thousands of messages we're receiving on Twitter and in the email inbox. I think people are dismayed. People are appalled. People are discouraged. People are exhausted. People are infuriated. You've been a premier. You've, you've held that position at a time where Albertans are feeling very emotional, uh, which is not always the best headspace to be in when you're dealing with crisis. What's your message to your fellow Albertans this morning? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really taken by the last comment you made right before I came on, Ryan, where, where the, the theme seems to be people saying, I don't recognize my province, what's going on? Uh, these aren't, these are, this isn't who we are. And, and quite honestly, I agree with that. I've spent a lot of time sort of looking at the numbers and looking at the kinds of graphs that, that Timothy Caulfield and others have been putting out uh, describing the differences in Alberta. And, and I don't believe, quite frankly, that we are as much of an outlier as it could currently seems. And I'll tell you something, those people at that rodeo down in Bowdoin, I mean, whatever, was there 1,500 of them, 2,000 of them? I don't know. But they're not Alberta. There are 4 million people, over 4 million people in this province. So let us not let these small minority groups of people convince us that's who we are. Unfortunately, and you talked about leadership, I think part of the reason that it has gotten out of control like this is because for 13 months, Brian, we have been led by a premier and a government who have consistently delivered mixed messages. They have dog whistled to that group of 2000 at the Bowdoin Rodeo. They have fanned the flames. They have put out their own misinformation. Forget about, you know, people answering polls. I may or may not have, have shared misinformation on, on social media. The, the, the UCP goes into the house and shares misinformation. Their MLAs get up and, and, and lecture people for being too concerned about safety um, and, and lecture people about how we wash our hands too much. And Jason Kenney sits by while that goes on. So, so this is, I would argue, uh, the, the outcome of 13 months of profoundly failed leadership by a government that itself is at best ambivalent and generally negative towards public health measures, towards the concepts of us making decisions and sacrificing our own uh, daily um, uh, uh, choices for the better of our neighbors. And yeah, that's hard. No one wants to do that day in and day out. That's it's, 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 it makes you tired. But the fact is, is, you know, we are people that do come together when necessary, but we need to be uh, given the facts and we need to have a consistent message and we need to be inspired to make those better choices to be our better selves. And from day one, this government has pitted public health against the economy. They've, they've claimed that this is an impingement on freedom. They've, they've delivered contradictory scientific information to the people of this province. And now Jason Kenney's uh, crying crocodile tears about this ridiculous group of whiners in Bowdoin. And quite frankly, he invited him to the party, quite frankly. Yeah, I don't even know if he deserves credit, uh, quite frankly, Ms. Notley, for crocodile tears. Uh, I, I think that, that Doug Ford managed to find a few tears to get his eyes all misty. But Alberta's premier, uh, far from that. If you were premier and you had your staff giving you the heads up that a prominent rodeo was being organized weeks ahead of time, weeks ahead of time, how would you have handled it? Well, I mean, you know, we would have, I, I mean, obviously the, um, we, we can't direct uh, uh, the, the police that, you know, we, we can't, but we, uh, we, uh, and we can come up with enforcement strategies. That is actually something that the government can do so don't let jason kenny say that they have absolutely nothing to do with it they wash their hands because that's not entirely true there are appropriate uh transparent ways in which uh politicians can ensure uh that that matters are are properly enforced and we would have done it they you know the the organizers would have gotten the message long before this rodeo was started that it wasn't happening and you know we've seen fences go up around uh, uh the you know grace Life church 
frankly, the same thing should have happened around where that rodeo was being held. It shouldn't have happened. You know, those are 2000 people. There were kids there. There will be infections that, that, that occur there. It will spread there. They will go home to their communities. They will make people sick. Um, and, you know, I, frankly, your analogy about uh, people driving down the road uh, and, and, and having a, you know, a, a, you know, a bush party and inviting everybody to a bush party where everyone, you know, drinks their 26er and then gets back on the road. I don't know if that was exactly your, your analogy. I might just be remembering high school, but either way, the reality is, is that, you know, that kind of thing happening when the police heard about that kind of thing happening back when I was 17, they went to the bush party and they said, what do you, you know, get out. And, and they didn't let people drive. So the same thing needs to happen here. Okay. So can I ask you uh, what you make of essentially what appears to be inaction on behalf of the RCMP, I mean, what's going on here? I mean, you you you're not going to blame. I mean, the average person. Here's what I think, and your point is very valid, and I agree with you that there are four, you know four point five million, uh, for all intents and purposes, fantastic people that comprise the fabric of this province, and people are talking about not my Alberta, and I feel like I'm going to leave, but I'm not going anywhere. I mean, that's what people are saying. I mean, nothing's changed there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, while we have the majority of people that will continue to comply with measures that are either specified or implied, while we have people that will, that will live that golden rule that will do what's best for their fellow humans, for their friends and neighbors out of respect and out of a sense of community, I guarantee you a ton of people will say, well, if they didn't stop a rodeo with hundreds and hundreds of people brazenly defying public health restriction, announcing their intentions, then I am having the boys over to throw darts. I am going to see my friend on their 40th birthday. I am absolutely going to have a little house party as long as everybody keeps it on the DL. I mean, this sets a very dangerous precedent. So what's your interpretation of the RCMP doing all but nothing? Well, you know, I, I, at this point, it's only speculation. I don't know exactly what was going on between, uh, uh, because, you know, the, the attorney general has two roles. The, he, he's in charge of the police uh, and he's also in charge of the courts. And of course, with the courts, you know, it's, it's your, your, your hands off. And obviously with particular investigations uh, with that the police engage in, of course, you're absolutely hands off. But, but you can, uh, as I say, you can adopt policy uh, and you can you can uh, as the solicitor general you can write charging policy uh, globally about certain rules and certain laws and if the laws are inadequate for the charges to be put in place well then quite frankly you can change the laws and quite frankly that's why we should be in the legislature right now discussing what is wrong with our laws uh, that uh, makes makes it apparently uh, difficult for individual police officers to believe that they can enforce them, uh, because we do have that right right and responsibility to to craft the laws in a way that they are eminently enforceable. So uh, there's different ways to go about that, and so I don't know exactly what's going on here and 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 where the problems arose, but I do know that the government can can uh, uh, intervene, and of course it, this rodeo quite honestly, is um, it, it's not the first of its kind. This stuff has been going on for months and months and months in different settings, and it's been growing and growing and growing. And this is just a continuation of that. This rodeo has grown out of all the smaller things that this government has failed to enforce. So, you know, as I say, it, it's not one moment in time. It's 13 months of, of bad decision making and and um, the government itself and Jason Kenney and the UCP themselves being conflicted on whether these rules should be in place or whether they and whether people should follow them. Um, so and, and of course, we now run the, the risk of more and more folks thinking, why why should I make sacrifices if, if nobody else is making sacrifices? Um, and I don't think that's people's best, even making asking that question is the best thing. And I think most people will be frustrated, but they won't necessarily take the, the path that's opened up to them, but some will. And, you know, again, again it comes from an absence of leadership. Uh, dodging pylons on Twitter hits me up and says, you know, when I got home from work at the hospital on Saturday and I saw the numbers, I literally wept says I'm not an ICU worker. I work in acute care medicine and on our COVID unit, it's max capacity. I'm so angry and frustrated, but mostly I'm just so, so tired. 
So the premier is going to address Albertans today at four o'clock. I'm curious to see what he'll say or if he'll take any questions. But why is it such a big deal that the spring session has essentially been put on hold for two weeks? What needs to be done that's not going to get done? Well, what we would have wanted to do is to use it as an opportunity to continue to push the government on a daily basis, face to face on on some critical issues that they need to be addressing. Obviously, there's there's the whole issue of restrictions as a whole. I mean, anyway, we could talk. I, I won't get lost in, in the, the many um inconsistencies uh, and failures around how they're managing this as far as the restrictions go right now. But, you know, we wanted to see them move on sick leave, for instance. I mean, it's just great that Jason Kenney and his team can, you know, not go into the legislature and not show up for work. It's just great that, you know, Jason Nixon can take two weeks and be in his isolation and not show up. And Jason Kenney's taken four weeks of isolation and, and not actually showed up to work. But we know that six 65 to 70 percent of Albertans can't do that. And so as a result, they have to go to work when they have symptoms. They have to go to work, even if they've been told that they might have been exposed to somebody who has COVID because they can't afford not to. And across this country, we are seeing more and more governments take seriously the need to introduce adequate, appropriate sick leave. That is a critical thing that is going to allow people to stay home and and avoid uh, spreading the virus. Um, And that was one of the things that we absolutely wanted to be able to talk about in the legislature. And so the fact that on one hand, we can't talk about uh, sick leave for the very people who are at risk each and every day when they go to work, because these clowns decide that it's too uh, dangerous for them to go to work while, you know, servers are literally um, weaving through tables of unmasked people each and every day because that's apparently safe, but it's not safe to go into a a room where we have uh, copious um, safety rules already in place. I know we have to let you go. We appreciate your time. Let me ask you this very quickly in closing. I've got a lot of people asking me to ask you if you would support the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, invoking the Emergency Measures Act, which would essentially, in layperson's terms, allow him to take over. Uh, What would the implications be and would you support it? Oh, I, I, you know, I... I, I would rather that uh, this premier come back to work and start doing his job. I, I you know, I, I can't, that, that is a, a step which is one too far. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, as Albertans, um, we need to demand that the guy that we made premier show up to work and do his job and do some of the basic things that people uh, expect of them. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the map, Brian, of of Canada and and the US that shows the the per capita rates and and you see that we are double of every other state and province. That's not on Albertans, that's on this premier. And, but it is on Albertans to hold this guy accountable. And it's on Albertans to get this guy to do his job. And let me just say, I've just been told a couple of minutes ago that uh, a couple of UCP MLAs are showing up to work in person for committees, which is fine. But then of course it puts to the lie, the rationale that was used by uh, Jason Kenney yesterday, that that's why they had to shut down the legislature. Do you credit them for showing up, those, those MLAs? Uh, well, I would credit them if they came along with the the other, however many uh, um, sixty members of their caucus, um, in order to actually be in the legislature. In the committees, we don't have question period. Mm. In the committees, the opposition doesn't get to run the agenda, or we don't get to run the agenda in the House either. But we don't get to propose legislation. The committees don't make decisions, so it's it's not unsafe for them to show up at a place where they're not held accountable. Uh, but it is unsafe to show up in the room where they are held accountable. Um, So what I want is consistency, honesty, transparency, and ultimately somebody to roll up their sleeves and get to work on behalf of this province. That's Rachel Notley, the leader of Alberta's official opposition, a former premier of Alberta. Thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Uh, RKS, Robbie Krieger-Smith says, you know, I may not have been an NDP supporter, but listening to Notley on Jespo, there's zero doubt in my mind Alberta would be in better shape with the pandemic and economically right now were she still premier. Instead, we've got rodeo clowns running the show. Meantime, Dingo Boy chimes in. 
says, uh, Sam, we can show this tweet. You know, I used to like your show, Ryan, but now I can see through the bullshit. You're like any other form of media outlet. You claim to represent all perspectives, but all you do is select those perspectives that align with your own. Dingo boy with no profile picture, one follower, not followed by anybody that I'm following, joined April of 2021. And a good morning to the Premier's staff signing up on all their new Twitter accounts. It's always great to hear from you. What other perspective would you like me to present this morning, Dingo Boy? What's the other perspective that matters here? People's rights to gather and rodeo as hundreds of people cling to life on ventilators and induced comas as the third wave of the pandemic spreads like wildfire across the province, stretching our health care resources, bringing people to their knees with 10 percent of all cases expected to live with long COVID in some circumstances for the remainder of their lives. What perspective other than what the fuck would you like me to represent this morning? If you can spell it out without using words like cuck or globalist or true dope or referencing the prime minister's haircut, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear the explanation, the logical, reasonable, community oriented explanation for why you would support gathering for a rodeo in the midst of a pandemic. I am all ears. Make sure you hashtag real talk RJ and rodeo clowns while you're at it the northwest fest international documentary festival may not be happening at the metro cinema this year but the show must go on so they put together an outstanding lineup of some of the year's best documentaries all of them available online real talk is proud to be the title sponsor of the global visions film series as part of northwest fest with a whopping 40 feature films plus 40 short films you can watch of course from anywhere from may 6th through the 16th this is your chance to stream some of the hottest new docs from canada and abroad many of which are canadian international world premieres you can learn more at northwestfest.ca and to our patreon subscribers stay tuned there's a special benefit coming your way We also wanted to say a big thank you to the team at Friesen Brothers for their continued sponsorship. You know, did you smell that over the weekend? More and more people getting the grills going. Well, it's that time of year where with Friesen Brothers culinary ideas and your plating skills, you're about to knock your family's socks off with what they have to offer from the sides, from what goes on the grill, the sourdough bread, the buns, and of course, those proteins, Friesen Brothers, for more than 65 years, has been very proud to present the best that Alberta has to offer, Alberta grown and Alberta owned at Friesen Brothers. A shout out today to those of you that spent the weekend trying to track down a truck as well. You know, it's trailer season, of course, and everybody's getting outside in their own ways. If yours involves a trailer, Maybe one of those fifth wheels or a boat and you're looking to upgrade your truck. I don't have to tell you it's tougher now than ever. Inventory's low for a number of reasons. That's why it matters that St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge have the best selection in the province. They can share back and forth between their two inventories and the customer comes first, including the way they approach their financing with some great offers right now for those who qualify on the Ram truck lineup, plus all those Jeeps that you see hauling boats around across the province of Alberta. Go see Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Well, we're hoping to check in with ICU Dr. Darren Marklin today, but it is quite understandable and completely okay if he's unable to join us. He told us earlier before we went on air, as mentioned, that he is running off his feet in the ICU today, which was all he needed to say on a number of fronts. It was a bit of a perspective check for us as we approached the show this morning. So we may hear from him, if not today, sometime later this week. We want to dig into the numbers and the trends and and figure out what it actually means, what it means to our frontline healthcare workers and our hospital capacities when we see these charts and graphs that disproportionately reflect Alberta. 
We're going to get to our live chat in just a moment. I'm going to read some more of your emails. Sarah Hoyles right now has been taking a look at what's making news this morning. So we thought we might break for a quick second to take a look at today's headlines. It's court day for the Grace Life Pastor. James Coates and the Edmonton Area Church face one charge of violating Alberta's Public Health Act. U.S. homeowners, or sorry, U.S. home builders are urging the Biden government to negotiate a new softwood deal with Canada. That's after lumber costs for a single family home have tripled over the last year. And Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, his party has lost a key state amid criticism over his pandemic response. Thanks very much, Sarah. I had a second there to check my email inbox. I haven't had a chance to scan what they all say, so I'm going to read <laughs> some of these of cold. There's, of There's a lot of them coming in. Um, if you send an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com, it's going to go to Sarah and myself, which is great. Double the chances that we're going to see what you've submitted. Mike writes in. I'll keep it on a first name basis. He says, I'm a surgeon that's working at an increasingly overwhelmed hospital in Edmonton. Over 80 percent of our ICU is full of COVID patients right now. Scheduled surgeries are being canceled. The situation is rapidly approaching crisis. And sadly, we probably won't see relief for two to three weeks, even if people start to pay attention to the experts Uh, Surgeon Mike says, I've been tweeting and posting on social media into what I feel is an echo chamber of despair. I hope that more people than ever will listen to your show and begin to realize that we're in serious trouble. The only way out of this, if we all work together, is to listen to the experts. The premier has proven he cannot lead us out of this. It is truly up to us. That from Surgeon Mike. A different Michael writes in and he says, I'm so glad you're having this talk this morning. He wrote in just about 30 minutes ago, says all these rodeo clowns, everybody else not taking this pandemic seriously. (laughs) Uh, Can eat horse shit as far as I'm concerned, says Michael. I mean, if I'm going to keep it real, let me keep it real. He says, this is absolutely disgusting. This is not the Alberta I've lived in for my 37 years. I can't believe what I see happening. He says, I grew up in rural Alberta and people there looked after one another. We made sure that we were taking care of everybody. He says, I now live in Calgary and how for most of my adult life and, and, and the common thread between rural and urban Alberta has been, in my experience, great people, people who are kind to one another, people who look out for each other. I truly don't understand what's happened. To willingly endanger your fellow citizens is shocking and appalling. He says, I honestly believe that Jason Kenney and the United Conservatives are the root of a lot of what's transpired lately. He says, as a matter of fact, I I don't believe it. I know it to be true. The premier has allowed these un-Albertan clowns to behave with zero consequences while they not only endanger their fellow citizens, but drag out this pandemic, not only leading to a further spread of the virus, but further damaging the economy and damaging the mental health that they so often attribute and speak as though they try to balance it out. This party has had a large percentage of its caucus speak out against restrictions. A large percent of the caucus ignore medical professionals' advice, even traveling internationally during this pandemic. They've put in ineffective restrictions, and they've been told countless times it's not enough, but they don't listen. He says, I can't help but remember when the premier called this a flu, reminding us that it was killing people that have already exceeded their life expectancy, Michael says. Read that again. Okay. I remember when the premier called it a flu and reminded us it was killing people who had already exceeded their life expectancy. In short, they have allowed this minority of irresponsible people to have the confidence, the swagger, to behave in an absolutely reckless manner. And now they run and hide. Because it's too dangerous to convene at the legislature. But frontline workers, teachers, wait staff, retail workers, medical professionals will still show up. He says, I could write a novel about how I'm feeling, but I'll probably just start to rant. I do thank you for hosting the talk. And it gives me at least a, a glimmer of hope to know that so many people 
are as upset as I am. That's an, that's another talk. That's another focus. Sarah brought it to the table. Rachel Notley brought it to the table. I'm curious to see where Sam Brooks is on this one. A lot of people pointing out that, hey, this cannot turn into rural versus urban because that's not what this is. This cannot turn into northern Alberta versus southern Alberta because that's not what this is. This isn't even United Conservatives versus New Democrats versus anybody else. How are you processing what you saw this weekend? You and I haven't yet talked about this. Yeah, I... (sighs) I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. I, I think that, you know, when uh, when former premier opposition leader Notley was on, she talked a lot about leadership and, and kind of the vacuum that we have it right now. And I just, you know, kind of like Sarah was doing, I wanted to take a bit of a macro view of this and, and, and say, like, what is this? What are these like large scale implications? And, and I think that it is entirely astute to say Jason Kenney trained people to do this, that that from day one of the pandemic, uh, Jason Kenney has always given a wink and a nod to this base that that believes in this, you know, libertarian ideology of freedom that 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 bubbles out from under the surface every time Albertans feel like, you know, they're not allowed to sneeze on the right side of the street. Um, that's that, that's kind of the attitude that it has here. The problem that I see is that, you know. Oh, let's let's think about the whole concept of a united conservative party, a, a party that brought the PCs and the Wild Rosers together. And and Jason Kenney very firmly when he came in said, you know, I'm the man in charge now. The party is going in my direction. And so like right off the bat, there was a fraction of the base, probably the older, more progressive conservative base that was immediately alienated from that party. And then we have time after time after time after time all year, Jason Kenny just going up to the line, but making sure there's a little back door left in that for his restrictions for for the base that wants to defy it. You know, Jason Kenny has been tacitly giving this base his nod of approval, and I think partly it's because it's the only base he has left. If Jason Kenny actually grew a pair and stood up and stood up to this part of his party that is causing these problems, well, he's already lost. The fir- you know the the more centrist part of the party, um, this is all he has left, and this is all he has left that is that is trying to rally. And and the other thing is they hate him right now. They hate him for putting any restrictions in. So I see a premier being a politician first and a leader. I was going to say a leader second, but I'm going to say a leader eighth maybe. Um, doing everything he can to keep the only base that he can possibly latch onto any more happy. And and well, I mean, quite frankly, letting people die in the process. That's that's the most blunt way to put it. White says, I hate to, to say it. But I think if the NDP were in power, there'd, there'd be even more covid violations. People would just do it because they hate the NDP. <laughs> the rodeo group is likely filled with the same people. I mean, here's I, I don't really I don't quite understand the whole idea around uh, if if it was the NDP, more people would break the, the, the rules because they don't like the NDP. We've we've had a method of 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 solving that type of thing throughout history, and it's called law enforcement. And as a matter of fact, it's this very unique phenomenon where regardless of where you live and who the government of power is, if you break the laws of the land, you pay the price and whether or not people would if it was premier rachel notley or if it was premier stephen mandel or premier david Kahn or any of the party leaders that were in that 2019 provincial election the fact of the matter is if there were restrictions in place and people announced their intention to break the restrictions there are steps that could be taken to prevent it if i disagree with paying taxes I mean, I'm not saying I expect thousands of pats on the back here, but ladies and gentlemen, I did file my taxes on time. I'm very happy to I'm very happy to announce I did file my taxes on time. I had very little to do with it. As a matter of fact, the team behind me helped ensure that that happened. But unfortunately, they let me know that that in fact, I cannot opt out of paying those taxes. That's that's the law of the land. That's how that works when it comes to uh, trafficking cocaine or trafficking human beings or driving impaired or abusing your spouse, or stealing from people, 
or scamming people and defrauding people. It doesn't really matter your personal perspective nor how you feel about the premier or the prime minister. You pay the price. And that's the thing, to be honest, Sarah, that I'm more hung up on than anything is why it, all of a sudden there's this perception that whether or not we adhere to the laws of the land is a matter of personal conviction and an optional one at that. That to me, that that's exactly where I get hung up because it's not about uh, the ability to be like, ah, that law, I'm going to. Yeah, that law I'm going to use. Okay, no, that law I'm not going to. Nah, I don't, I don't like that one. That one is an inconvenience. I that not interested. And I think that's where the kind of patchwork of enforcement had what it's done. I mean, to Sam's point, it's it's been this build, this build of oh, we don't we don't enforce these rules seriously, so you don't need to take them seriously. And looking at, I mean, I, I was just interested because looking at, you know, this isn't the first, this isn't our first rodeo um, around having a pandemic. This nobody, fed- nobody will blame you for, for saying that, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, was very, that was very well played. <laughs> I try. Um, so the Spanish flu, it was in Alberta. I mean, it was all over the world, but it was in Alberta and around uh, between 1918 and 1920. And it affected uh, 500 million people. And you can say, I mean, what you were just speaking about, Ryan, about the idea that, oh, if it was the NDP government, there would be more infractions. No, actually, when we look here, we see that the masks mandate for the Spanish flu. So a century ago, the Board of Health ordered citizens to wear masks in public and So it was mandated. It was actually required. Whereas currently during the coronavirus, no, masks have not been mandated. Um, Some businesses are requiring customers to to wear them when they enter the premises. So it's now been downloaded to individuals who don't really have any, you know, recourse. If someone doesn't, I mean, yeah, they get they get told that they uh, can't enter the the business. But as far as enforcement, there's no way to actually enforce it through fees or uh, tickets of some sort. There's closures. Uh, there were schools were closed during the Spanish flu, and right now. Schools, only some of them are closed. Wouldn't it be, I mean, to say something that, that lacks the profound nature that I would hope to add to something like this, to, <laughs> to point out the obvious, but just to, just to wonder, you wonder how different public attitudes may have been with the lack of the World Wide Web, mm. with the lack of the internet, with the lack of social media, uh, perhaps more difficult for public health professionals and authorities to communicate these mandates, but also fewer opportunities for jackasses to release their so-called alternative facts, right? Yeah. Fewer armchair scientists sharing their personal thoughts on Facebook. I mean, you wonder if there was more buy-in or if the defiance perhaps wasn't as evident because the information, the images weren't as easily shared. I would have been curious to see what the buy-in would have been 100 years ago, 103 years ago versus today. I, yeah, that is a really interesting point. I, but I do feel that, you know, the, there is, it can be used as a really fantastic tool to get credible, important information out there. I think what the lack has been has been that there's not been consistency. Hmm. The consistency to me is what has been the problem. If we had had consistent measures, because frankly, I can't keep them all straight. They keep changing all the time. If we had had consistent rules right out of the gates, man, I keep using rodeo terms, but anyways, <laughs> um, if we had consistent, uh, we could buck the trend. We really you want me to could wrap that up for you yeah, with a bow. Thank you. That was that was a triple threat. That was a hat trick, if you will. Yeah, we're taking a look live into our inbox here, where Dan says, uh, "Jespa, longtime listener, first time writer. Hey, Dan, thanks and welcome to the show on air." It says five years ago, the beast forced the evacuation of Fort McMurray. People came together work camps set up rooms for families that were unable to evacuate 
by way of highway, WestJet and Air Canada stepped up to fly folks to Edmonton and Calgary to literally escape the fire. Families in Edmonton and Calgary invited folks into their homes while theirs either burned or were simply uninhabitable. The federal and provincial governments stepped up to help people and provide food and water and shelter to anybody impacted by it. We didn't have anyone running into the bush claiming fires aren't real or that this was a big conspiracy from big insurance or that the whole thing was a way to keep the oil sands down or that Leo DiCaprio or James Cameron or Al Gore was trying to scare people away from dirty Alberta oil. We came together and as a province... We demonstrated the same thing we did when our province flooded in 2013. And yet some of these same people are now attending these anti-mask freedom rallies. That's F-R-E-D-U-M-B. They don't believe anything that the experts are saying. We're gaslit by a premier who exhibits atrocious leadership and a failure to enforce restrictions or fines. It just reinforces this bad behavior by the rodeo clowns and their ilk. What happened? Dan says, I've lived in Alberta my entire life, born in Calgary, raised in High River. I've worked all across the province. I've never felt so hopeless for the future of my home. Maxine wrote in to say, I'm a teacher. And on Wednesday, April 7th, I tested positive with the B117 variant. I spent 13 days in isolation. Fortunately, I only required paramedics to attend once. I didn't need the hospital, let alone the ICU, thankfully, but I'm still away from work indefinitely as I recover from long COVID. I'm much too scared right now to deal with the fact that I might end up with a lifetime of consequences, so I call it longer covid The mental, emotional, and physical consequences of COVID are my reality. When this government talks about natural immunity, you're talking about being fine with me contracting COVID. You're fine with those of us suffering long-term consequences. And you're fine, quite frankly, with people dying. Natural immunity equals sickness and death. I plead and implore this government to stand up and be brave. Maurice wrote in, a school counselor, who says, I can't thank Real Talk enough for shining a light on the sheer incompetence of this government. We have students who attended the rodeo in Bowdoin over the weekend, while a third of our students and staff are currently isolating at home, some confirmed sick with COVID. It's sobering, says Maurice, to know the only thing standing between myself and COVID is an old Navy face mask procured by the province and the decisions of these rodeo clowns. That from Maurice. And how about this one from John? John CCs us, talk at ryanjesperson.com on his email to the premier, to the health minister, to the education minister, and to his MLA. Premier Kenny says, John, two years ago, I watched as my family members voted for you and your party, and I cautioned them against it, and we fought, and it was awful. Today, we're not fighting. We're united in confusion, anxiety, sadness, and unfortunately, isolation. But we're doing what we can to keep our families, communities, and neighbors safe. Why the hell aren't you? You shot to power after dreaming of it for so long. But what's the point of power if you're afraid to use it? What's the point? He's not afraid to use it, John. It's how he uses it that's the problem. John says, my son's at school this morning. My wife and I are working from home, slowly losing our sanity. My brother's at his job, risking his health. My other brother, he's barely surviving because you've already completed your attack on AISH recipients. Why aren't you doing anything? He says, I didn't sleep at all last night, Premier. I'm overwhelmed and afraid. I worry about my son at school right now. We are all worth so much more than you taking time off from work when things get tough. You've done nothing except what? Tweeting about oil? getting its due, tweeting about a rodeo after everybody goes home, an ill-advised emergency alert, grow up. Stop vilifying us. Stop working against us. A few months back, I watched as an old schoolmate publicly died on social media. What happened next? 
You eased restrictions and numbers shot up. I see people gathering. What are you doing? Blaming ethnic communities. Grace Life Church, keep the faith. The rodeo, get a grammar challenged staffer to tweet storm. Numbers higher than any other province or state in North America. You go home and expect us to do something about it. We are not the premier of Alberta. That's you. Get to work. Your legacy right now, as far as I can see, is death. I'm sorry to say it. That's your story. The best I can do is to tell you this. The best you can do is to get to work and use that power that you thirsted for to fix what we've created. There's no power if you can't use it. I'm tired. I'm afraid. There's no wit, no jokes, no satire. I'm barely holding it together. The next time my family goes to the polls, what do you think is going to happen? The cards are on the table, Premier. We see you. Don't run away. Shut things down. Close the schools. Support the families. If it costs you your job, at least you'll leave with integrity intact. And maybe, just maybe, we'll both be able to sleep at night. That from John. In just a second, I'm going to talk to a representative from a coalition of Alberta's live events professionals. It's the Alberta Live Events Coalition. That coming up in just a moment, as you can imagine, they're not thrilled that a live event welcomed hundreds and hundreds of people over the weekend. Thousands of Albertans working in live events have been trying to keep their businesses alive, trying to keep their heads above water for about 14 months now. That conversation coming up in a quick second. I wanted to remind you, though today feels like one entire edition of Trash Talk from start to finish on Friday, we will be wrapping up our show with a segment presented by Local Waste Services. You send us the email in the subject line, write Trash Talk, like the approximately 464 people have done since we went on air this morning. We pick out the best ones. What's grinding your gears? What's driving you nuts? And we head into the weekend with, well, that cathartic exercise. The team at Local Waste wants to remind you that air is free, but it's expensive to dump. And so if your current garbage bin provider, your small business, is selling you the big bin when you only fill it up halfway, give Local Waste a call. Find them online at localwaste.ca. They build their business relationship as your business grows from start and small to big it's all about integrity which is one of their core values you can learn more by giving them a call lauren mckell or chris all the details under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com we also wanted to remind you that the team at westworld computers powers this studio every single morning but they're aware that it's been a tough year for people and while you may be needing to upgrade your iMac, your MacBook Pro, your iPad, your watch, even your phone, you may not have the budget to do it big time. And so that's why they offer their gently pre-owned Mac lineup. They've got the software reinstalled and the warranty reapplied. Go see Daryl and his team today, either in person on 170th. They're taking all COVID precautions at the store they've family owned for more than 40 years. And you'll also find them online at westworld.ca. Caitlin McLehone is the owner at CM Events. She's an award-winning professional event planning uh, company. She steers the ship there. I've had the pleasure of working with her myself at events in past, and Caitlin understands firsthand what it's like to have an entire industry basically ground to a halt as a result of this pandemic. She's here this morning speaking on behalf of a task force that was established in March of 2020 to discuss best practices for staging live events in a safe manner. It's called the Alberta Live Events Coalition. Caitlin, welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This is wonderful. And uh, like always, I have been enjoying listening ever since 830 this morning. Well, so thanks. thanks so much. <laughs> we, we, we've had a lot to say. And, and what I when I say we, it's the collective we. It feels like uh, the province kind of comes together today to try to sort this out. That's the vibe that we've been getting. Before I ask you about your specific thoughts around this rodeo, uh, why don't you give us a pretty clear sense as best you can of what this past year or so has meant for you and the thousands of other event professionals across the province of Alberta. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. um, uh, I mean, I I feel like the live events industry is one that almost nobody knows about. And so anytime we've talked on the media, uh, expressed our story, our frustration, the dire 
dire state that, I mean, you said thousands, it's tens of thousands of people in just Alberta, almost 300,000 event professionals across the country. Um, you know, we are intertwined into so many industries and we were collapsed overnight. No warning, no conversation, no, hey, how can we work together? Just you're done, out of business, here's some money to help you get through. Um, and that's super devastating. And, you know, although I shared the huge amounts of anger, I mean, it makes me emotional just thinking about uh, these rogue events starting to happen um, without getting proper exemptions and going through the channels and not trying to keep people as safe as possible. It hurts our industry. We have already been closed for over 15 months. We were closing back in February, like last February, we were the first to close. Our industry will be the last to open everything you know like i don't think people really understand what it is that event professionals do the value we bring to our cities and to the country the economic impact that events have on tourism and in just general revenue for each of the cities and towns across this province it is billions uh that is no longer there right now we need to get back to work and we need to do it safely and every time a rogue event happens it sets us back even further. So you're uh, like like literally millions of other people across the country. I was watching my pal Ian Hannah Mansing last night, Anchor the National on CBC. It's their lead story. The end the lockdown rodeo in Alberta. Where's your head at as you're watching those highlights and as you're paying attention to the chatter on social media? How are you feeling this weekend? Yeah, I, I mean, same as a mimic in so many of your viewers, so much frustration, so much anger. Um, I also share, um, you know, a, a similar opinion to Sarah's. There is a huge underlining issue here that, that I feel like maybe we don't talk about enough throughout the pandemic. I, although do not condone, the Alberta Live Events Association does not promote this. We Event professionals are angry, right? Everyone wants to get back to work, but we need to do it safely. We need to work with government. We need to have a runway of time. Um, all those things need to be put into place first. But I share the Cowboys frustrations. I, I almost understand that complete devastation to your livelihood, to your life, to your income, to your family, to everything that you know about how to live. And when it's completely wiped away, you get desperate. And that's where some of these rogue events are starting to happen. We see it with weddings. We see it with, you know, business meetings and things like this, where you're starting to push the envelopes because you feel so desperate. You just want it to be over. I get it. We want it to be over too. But, but like you said, look at these numbers. We, you know, not all events are equal and not all events can be held safely right now. Uh, and we need to work together not against the system. We need to work together to move forward. Caitlin, I'm curious for, for what you're seeing. And, and, and as mentioned, I mean, this is, this is a coalition. How, how many members, by the way, of the, of the Alberta Live Events Coalition? We have about 50 um, uh, kind of uh, advisory group uh, members who've been working with us for uh, just over a year now. And we have kind of a core team of about 10 that have been diligently working with government on so many calls, so many emails, so many meetings, um, just desperately trying to get attention, trying to get a seat at the table um, so that we can um, help to um, guide some decisions um, uh, around events and gatherings and help to create language that is consistent. You know, I share that frustration, so many inconsistencies this year. Uh, so we're represented all across the province, primarily between Edmonton and Calgary. And uh, and this group has been working really, really hard. KT is watching and, and on our live chat says, absolutely, Caitlin, nobody knows about our jobs in professional event management because when we do it well, we're invisible. And that is the truth. Uh, the best wedding planner is the one that you never notice. The best AV pro, audiovisual, uh, saying this as a professional event host is, is the one that nails it every single time. People take it for granted, almost how talented they are among your group of, of 50 and then the advisory council of 10. I'm sure that you have eyes and ears all over the place. How common are these so-called rogue events? You touched on weddings. What else are you seeing? How common do you think this is that may not be as high profile as this rodeo? 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're starting to see it more in the last kind of six weeks for sure, especially since spring has started, the weather is nicer, people are just done, right? Um, and I, I mean, I get, I, get, I get where that comes from. And I'm super proud of so many of the event professionals that I know within this industry who have said no. You know, I understand that you have called, you have this wedding that you think is small for only 50 to 70 people, or you have, you know, this small private event, or you have this small meeting or whatever it is, but no, we will, we cannot participate in that. It goes outside of the guidelines, but if you'd like to run a safe event within the guidelines, we are here to show you how to do that. And, and where the disappointment is and the immense amount of frustration is when people are like, okay, no problem. We'll just call around until we find someone who will. And they will, they will find someone who will be like, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll do that event for you for 50 people outside of the, the guidelines and the rules because people are getting desperate for their livelihoods, to pay their bills, to keep their businesses afloat, to just move on. And uh, uh, I know with the Alberta Live Events Coalition, we did reach out to this rodeo. We expressed huge amounts of concern. We encouraged them not to go ahead and, and we received pushback, we received negative comments, um, but we would have loved the opportunity to work with them, show them how to go through the exemptions with Alberta Health Services, go through how to keep uh, an event at this point of the pandemic as safe as possible for, for your guests uh, how to and how to set that up. Because event professionals are risk managers. Our job is to keep people safe at events. That is our job. Besides the pandemic, that is always top of mind. You know, how do you get people in line control safely? How do you set up your floor plan or your site map so that people are safe, so that they can evacuate if needed? We are constantly analyzing risk of events. And we really want government to understand this. We are, we are not some fluff industry that just started for no reason. We are trained and educated, smart, and we work with really, really good people who can keep events safe. But we can't do it if people are just are just doing it for no reason because they're angry. Can you, <laughs> That's not helpful. Caitlin, can you give us some more insight into what the message was back from rodeo organizers to your coalition? I mean, what specifically did they say? Um, you know, essentially just that they were upset that we were not supportive, you know, uh, being part of the live events industry and that they were going to go ahead regardless um, and, and just kind of left it at that. And, um, you know, at that point, I mean, there's, there's not much else that, that we can do, right? We hope that, like has been chatted about this morning already, that government and RCMP kind of step up and maybe take action or that, you know, they didn't get as many people as they were anticipating, which obviously wasn't true. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think, that, you know, that's all that we could do was try. We reached out, we gave concern, and we got a huge amounts of pushback. What do you think this might do to the industry, generally speaking. I mean, do, do you think that this is going to create, we spent some time talking last week and, and this is mental health week. So we're going to be talking about COVID impacts and relationships and friends and neighbors and family and all kinds of things this week. Um, do you believe that there could be a chasm that's created or that develops or a rift that's, that's maybe already there among event professionals in the province, those that have fought like hell to keep businesses alive and, and, and stuck with or adhered to restrictions and those that haven't? Oh, I mean, maybe. I uh, Everyone is on edge, right? Everyone. It's not just event professionals. The whole province is on edge. Um, but yeah, we, we don't want to create a division between us and them, you know, event professionals following the rules and those that are not. That's that is not helpful for anyone. We we really, really want this opportunity to work with government so that we can move our industry forward, so that we can create guidelines and timelines and an opening plan that makes sense. Uh, and so that you don't have these rogue events, you don't have, you know, concerts going underground and weddings happening, um, you know, when they're not supposed to and all of these sorts of things. We want to be able to work together so that we can do this safely. But if it if this goes on for much longer, people are going to keep getting desperate and they're going to keep making decisions around that desperate feeling of getting their livelihoods back. I can tell you, you know, event professionals are are not doing well. Some have huge businesses with massive overhead and huge amounts of staff. And you cannot sustain that on the little bits of grants and funding and things that has been available to um, people in our position over the past year. 
Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned lobbying government or, or, you know, attempting to create a everybody sees that word lobby and kind of bristles a little bit. I mean, it's not necessarily an inherently bad word, but you've been looking to work with government in an, somewhat of an advisory role uh, to help develop policy, procedure, parameters, et cetera. Um, what has been the response of this government? Would you characterize it as willing to work with you, willing to hear you out? What, what's that process been like? Oh, I mean, I would like to give some positive news here, but uh, I mean, some have been um, very supportive. There's been some ministers um, and some MLAs that have really helped to be a voice for our industry and, and even get us front and center. I mean, keep in mind, we are not even recognized in the eyes of the government as a real profession, as anyone who brings any kind of economic benefit to society um, or jobs or, and all of these sorts of wonderful things. Uh, so it's been really, really hard to start from the bottom and move move forward. And only now uh, it has taken us, you know, over a year, but we have now been given a small seat at the table to have round table discussions with Dr. Hinshaw's team and Jason Kenny's team to try to figure out how to move forward. And there are some big events um, uh, that would like to go ahead in the summer. Um, they don't want to happen without proper exemptions and proper guidance and, and all these sorts of things. And we need to have a seat at the table to move forward. Uh, Alberta, I mean, Edmonton, we're festival city. We are known globally for our events. This is not just something small that has gone away for a year. This is a huge part of Alberta's culture. This is a huge part of our economic revenue. This is a huge part of our job pool that needs to start to come back. But we need to do it together. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin McLehone uh, is the owner at CM Events. I should not deny you your other official title as well, Logistics Queen. I've seen you in action <laughs> and a representative of the Alberta Live Events Coalition. You can find them at AB Events Coalition on Facebook. Caitlin, thanks for your advocacy. I can't wait to be back at work with you. I can't wait to be in a room of 2,000 people that are inoculated when we can do it safely. Without kind of looking over our shoulder, metaphorically and otherwise, I can't wait to start fundraising again. I can't wait to be celebrating people's achievements. I can't wait to be making a whole lot of noise, clinking glasses, spilling beers on each other, hugging, shooting selfies. It's going to be a wonderful thing, and I know we'll be back there. I know we will. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, we will be back. We will, and we just in, and we are encouraging companies and individuals to be diligent. Let's do this together. We want events back. Oh, we want them back, and we are here, and we are working on it. So let's do it together. You got it. Thanks, Caitlin. Really appreciate it. That's Caitlin McLehone of CM Events. You know, she touches on that. You know, people are so eager to get back to work. People are desperate. Nobody denies that. Everybody's desperate. It's not just the people at the rodeo everybody's in trouble. Everybody's desperate in their own way. Everybody's exhausted. Everybody's sick and tired. Do the folks that are putting on the boots and throwing on the cowboy hats and heading out to Bowdoin for the rodeo think they're the only ones? What makes them so special? Kaylin talks about that desire, you know, to, to hold the wedding. And so you move it underground or the desire to, for an event professional to earn that ten or fifteen thousand dollars that they so desperately need, so they agree to do the rogue event, where then people become infected. My wife, as a matter of fact, tweeted about this this weekend. Carrie Skelton, she's a lifestylist, a blogger. You can read her work at carrieskelton.com. Give her a follow on Instagram. She says, you know, to rally with no masks because you're tired of wearing masks. Only to be the reason we'll all have to wear masks even longer. And the reason more people will die and travel restrictions will be extended. And the list goes on. This is idiocy and selfishness at its finest. You look at the jurisdictions that are essentially back to normal, so to speak. And they all have one thing in common. They enacted strict measures and they stuck to them. And there was enforcement and people bought in. And now... They're back. I promised I'd read as many tweets as we could fit into the show. Those of you that use the hashtag Rodeo Clowns, you tagged our show, you responded to my tweets. Denise said, you know, United Conservative voters claimed they wanted fiscal responsibility, and they did. 
They condemned NDP spending to create Alberta jobs, then bawling and whining about their perceived loss of freedom. They selfishly became rodeo clowns, further crushing livelihoods and increasing government spending on health care. That from Denise. Let me say my personal take on this is, is th- this is not on all United Conservative voters. I see a, a lot of messaging online, and, and, I, and I believe some of it to be unproductive and divisive and dangerous, as a matter of fact. Everything along the lines of if you voted for Jason Kenney, you are responsible for this. What I'm seeing is Alberta Conservatives, United Conservative Party members, stepping up and saying, this ain't us. And this guy does not represent what this party needs to represent. The accountability needs to start at the grassroots of the party. Jason Kenney may not listen to you. He may not listen to me, but he'll listen to his donors. And he'll listen to the people that bought party memberships and that voted for him. And it starts with you, my fellow Albertans. Tom says, you know, this event. This rodeo marks a collapse of any credibility Alberta has for restrictions and warnings of enforcement going forward. Shauna says it's unforgivable that the premier and the chief medical officer of health and the health minister are choosing to allow the worst spread in over a year to go on unchecked half restrictions. No enforcement is a choice. And Shauna says, as far as I'm concerned, they're responsible for all new cases. Onion on my belt says, here's some freedom. Are they seeking hospital care? Look at their phones. If GPS puts them at the rodeo or any other lockdown protest, they get escorted out. Freedom's the right they want? Fine. They can get it over the right to health care. I see a lot of people saying that, Sarah. If you attended the rodeo, you should surrender your right to public health care. Of course, that's not how it works. And we've not been a society that's conducted itself in that way. If you smoked, you don't get the treatment for your lung cancer. If you overate, I understand I could step in one here. You don't get treatment for diabetes. If you rode a motorcycle, we won't look after your shattered femur. That's not how we work. And it's not how it goes. No. And I don't think that's how it should go. I think... (laughs) I mean, with that... that (laughs) Because not everybody that is going to be showing up uh, at hospitals took that approach. I mean, people have spoken today about how the people that attended the rodeo, their kids, are going to go to school today. And people will be infected that way. The thing that just keeps standing out to me is, like, I'm I'm very um, taken aback and... Words we, words are failing me because there isn't a word that actually like I can say disappointed, I can say angry, I can say disheartened, but it's but but times a billion or a trillion. <laughs> um, to me, I'm I'm solution focused, so I'm wondering. Okay, so we we are hearing from hundreds of people <laughs> via social media, via email. Now what? And I don't know to make a pop culture reference, but. That show that is based on the Margaret Atwood book, uh, Handmaid's Tale, uh, the fourth season just came out. And in it, uh, maybe it's going to be a spoiler alert, but here we go. Spoiler alert. Um, the main character, June, says, you know, I'm paraphrasing, we, we keep waiting for someone to show up to, to help us and to rectify the situation and, and, and save us. And she says, they're not coming. <laughs> we have to do something. And so to me, that's where my, where my gut is now pushing me is, okay, so what are the steps we can take? What we, we know, thanks to this show, that there is, you know, a large contingent of folks that say, this is not okay. We are not okay with this. Something needs to be done. What can be done? So that's where my mind is going now is, okay, so what are our options? I know that, you know, speaking with the leader of the opposition, Rachel Notley, saying, you know, that they need the the government needs to show up so they can talk about what measures can be taken. And to say, to couch it in the idea that, oh, it's because we're scared of COVID. Um, We're worried about the spread of COVID. That's why we're not going in. Mm, That doesn't wash. It just, it doesn't. We need, we know that it's, it's because they know they will be held accountable Unfortunately, you know, we are, as far as like government levers, what are our options? The, the option around bringing Trudeau in 
is that's not an option i mean it's theoretically it's not a serious option no precisely so so what what are our options that's where i that's where i'm going right now well it starts with engagement mm. and it starts with demanding more from your government mm. and it starts with phone calls and emails and 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 messaging to shows like this it starts with applying pressure to your elected officials it starts by talking to your friends and neighbors and your family members and taking citizen action wherever you can, supporting frontline workers, being loud, being unignorable. You know, what you just said reminded me of a tweet that I was happy to amplify over the weekend from Edwin Munt, who says, and, and this is a Mr. Rogers quote, by the way, as a matter of fact, it's, yeah. a, bu- it's a beautiful Mr. Rogers quote. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Look for the helpers, we are told, when bad things happen. The premier is not a helper. He's done nothing but make it harder for the helpers. A profound betrayal of public office. But I wonder, like, I really wonder about, you know, we have to make noise. Absolutely. But how many lawn signs can we have? Let's find out. Okay. I, I, point taken? Because, I just... if we, because if we don't start to answer the question of what can we do and, and where does the action start? Because every show, every interview... Every bit of public commentary, every single element of real talk should wind up in a call to action. Mm. We inform ourselves and then we act. What's the call to action? The call to action might be, as we get into positive reflections a few minutes, a call to action might just be to go outside and take a breath of fresh air and tell somebody you love them. We'll wind the show up with positivity. Trust me. (laughs) I can't wait for it. I don't want to wallow in this despair. But at the same time, that's what they want. They want you to blow off some steam and then forget about it and move on. They see you angry about curriculum. They see you angry about coal exploration on the eastern slopes. They see you angry about elected officials telling you to stay home over the holidays and then traveling to Phoenix and Mexico and Maui. And then they see you forget. Mm. They see you forget that there are still lingering questions and an open investigation about the leadership race. They see you forget about the fact that they're taking control of people's pensions. They see you forget about lifting caps on things like tuition and car insurance. They see you forget about thing after thing after thing. Jason Kenney said it himself in a speech a couple of years ago that you legislate with such speed that it's virtually impossible for the opposition to do its job. It is a strategy And the people of Alberta have the power to remind this government who calls the shots. The people have the power. And that starts with citizen action. It has to start somewhere because if we don't believe that letters and phone calls and lawn signs and public pressure are effective, then what? Well, I I think that those are part of the equation. I'm I'm hearing, uh, you know, there's there's, you know, chatter around. A strike of some sort. A general strike. Yeah. To, to basically say, you know, okay, so money talks. Money's the, the bottom line here for this government. So let's, let's, you know, talk their language, which is to not show up to work and grind the economy to a halt. Maybe then they'll listen. I don't know. To me, it's, it frustrates me to hear that, you know, event planners have to decide you know, where are their values and should they, and and it's not just event planners. I mean, it's people working at um, processing plants. It's people working at restaurants, but why is it their job to enforce and to make these tough calls? It's, it needs to stop being downloaded um, to people that actually don't have a way to properly enforce. So I'm not, I don't mean to disparage lawn signs. I think that they're important and they're part of the equation. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm looking for solutions. So, <laughs> and as you can tell, I've kind of come to a, a stop on that and wondering, yeah, what can we do short of, I mean, I've, I almost envy, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't even say this out loud, uh, um, but this is real talk. So here we go. <laughs> um, the idea that, uh, you know, the American public they got a chance to go to the polls and do the referendum on the leadership but we've still got two years and there's a lot like and if we're legislating if if jason kenney is legislating at that breakneck speed 
heaven only knows where we're going to be in two years. If I'm a United Conservative Party supporter, I know that there's no way in hell that Jason Kenney wins another election in the province of Alberta. And I recognize that a new leader is going to need an opportunity to put a stamp on the party. And I'm also recognizing the importance of putting in a leader that Albertans can connect with, that can mm. that can prompt Albertans to reevaluate their understanding of what this party represents. I don't know if Jason Kenney makes it to the next election. If he does, if his arrogance and if his stubbornness prompts him to stay in that position, I think I think he's going to get walloped at the polls. I really do. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a change in leadership. The question is who you, you, you could replace Jason Kenney with somebody that would be worse, believe it or not. Uh, and that would be a huge decision for United Conservative Party members, many of whom are friends and family of mine, many of whom I know love this province adore this province live as proud representatives of this province mr g responds to me on twitter says you know combined with the, the legislative shutdown talking about the rodeo combined with the shutdown of the legislature the lowbrow hoedown has forced me to extend my rage gauge rage gauge might need to be a segment on real talk We'll give Mr. G credit if we do it, Sam. Hey, Kenny doesn't want to haul his ass into face the music because it's too uncomfortable to sit with his head up there, says Mr. G. Steph says, you know, just as January 6th, that's all you need to say. January 6th, everybody knows when you say January 6th. Just as that was not an ad hoc protest event in D.C. that somehow came together, neither was this rodeo. The number of people, many of whom are not local, the venue, the animals, all reek of a moneyed and expert organization. Who are they, wonders Steph. Jeff says the most galling thing to me about this rodeo clown story is the completely arbitrary enforcement of regulations. Alberta Health Services will fence off a church but refuses to stop a rodeo. I mean, let's give Alberta Health Services a little bit of credit for fencing off a church after weeks and weeks and weeks of non-compliance. And quite frankly, after if, the Easter weekend, after the Easter weekend. And if I know where they're gathering now, if I know, I have a hard time believing that the province doesn't. I have a really hard time believing that the RCMP and Alberta Health Services don't know where that church is gathering now. If I know. Tina says, I'm a healthcare worker and we are exhausted. How many times have we heard that if we did a word cloud of the show today, I think exhausted might be the biggest one. Tina says, I've not seen my parents nor siblings in over a year as we try to do the right thing and not travel there in northern Alberta. I cried when I received my vaccine as I finally saw hope. Now I only see chaos again. And that from Tina. Lisa wonders why there are so many people in Alberta that seem to be so contrary to compassion, to belief in science. Says, I don't understand, and I know that unfortunately nothing anybody can say or what the science tells us will change their minds. Brian says, it's depressing, demoralizing, and downright pisses me off. A lack of common sense courtesy of any leadership in this province, it seems. I miss my family, and this is just a slap in the face. That from Brian. One of the things that was driving me nuts is the assertion from some of the jerks promoting this rodeo that if you don't like it, you can stay home. If you don't like it, you can stay home. Just an absolute misunderstanding of how a virus works. An absolute ignorance around the impact of personal action on a collective community. I mean, just you either have to be a sociopath or an idiot to believe that it's acceptable to hold mass gatherings unmasked with no distance and suggest that people will be just fine if they simply stay away. As though you lack even the most basic understanding of 14 months of in-depth coverage on why a pandemic spreads like wildfire and what variants mean and the limitations of inoculations, never mind people's health realities, comorbidities, and the like. Comorbidities are not a reason to explain away the significance of somebody dying from COVID-19. Comorbidities are things that your friends and family live with maybe you yourself 
And I recognize to a certain degree as I stare into this camera lens that I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I hope that even one person that needs to hear this hears this. Comorbidities are things like asthma or someone undergoing cancer care and chemotherapy, somebody that may have diabetes or some other immunocompromised disease. Comorbidities are things like you had pneumonia as a child and 40 years later, your scarred lungs are not prepared for the rigorous exercise that COVID-19 implies in many circumstances. Comorbidities are not justification for anything. They're the reality that the majority of people carry. And our lack of empathy and our lack of concern for our fellow human beings on display in deplorable fashion this weekend. And as a collective, I think we stand up and say no. I want to thank you so much for being part of this conversation today. This is just the beginning. We're going to try to get on top of our email inbox. I'm going to be all over social media for the rest of the day, as will our team. Keep the comments coming. You know that you will have, we promise, coverage that you can trust, coverage that you can share as Alberta continues to fight its way out of this an unprecedented pandemic challenge. We're really excited to be partnering up, as you know, with the team in Clean Air Club. And we spend so much time talking about the health moves that we can make. What can we do to improve our family's shot at a healthy month or a healthy year? And one of those is changing our furnace filters, changing literally the quality of the air we breathe. Clean Air Club on their website, cleanairclub.ca, takes the size of your filter. It's literally the only work you need to do. You punch in your address, the next thing you know... They drop your furnace filter replacements off at your front door and you're going to pay less than you do in the big box store. So what's the catch? There isn't one. It's why so many real talkers have signed up at cleanairclub.ca. We're excited to be telling you about a new partnership with Power Ed by Athabasca University. It's short online and on-demand professional development courses and certificates. They're leading edge. They're flexible. It's on-demand learning when it suits your schedule. They're always available, so they fit into your schedule, not the other way around. Courses and certificates in areas like leadership, digital wellness, allyship and inclusion, artificial intelligence and machine learning, digital transformation, project management, and more. Power Ed assists organizations to develop and deploy their own digital learning strategies. Check it out today at PowerEd. .ca. And a shout out to our fantastic sponsors at Kubi Energy. I saw a note over the weekend that the team at Kubi has been busy in BC lately. You can check them out on Instagram. Of course, they've got offices in Edmonton and Kamloops, which means they can cover Western Canada. Whether it's a residential project, a commercial or industrial project, they've done a ton of them from the modest ones all the way up to the big ones like the Edmonton Convention Center. If you check out kubienergy.ca today, you can find out more about how they can help you transition to a more sustainable energy plan. Every Monday, Kubi Energy also proudly presents a little something we call Positive Reflections. Sam, you and I have been waiting almost a full week to show off these photos. Everybody that's listening to this on the podcast, you must check out our special file. You can find Positive Reflections released as an individual link via our YouTube channel. Or, of course, just go to the end of Monday's show. These sent in from Travis. Prepare to be wowed my friends look at this travis says i don't know what it is about seeing wolves in the wild but it almost feels like a spiritual experience he says maybe it's the haunting stare or the look at that photo are you kidding me the obvious intelligence but i consider being able to experience these apex predators a blessing he says these were taken last weekend in banff we turned a corner and this beautiful wolf was right there to greet us of course from the safety of our truck He says, my wife Taylor and I have taken up the hobby of wildlife photography over the last couple of years. Amidst the panic of there being an actual wolf in our presence, my wife was able to snap these beautiful images. Travis says, I hope you and other real talkers enjoy. That is one of the most beautiful animals I think I've ever seen in my entire life. I would agree with that. 
I, Look at I've, been, eyes. I've been waiting to show these off all week. Oh, man. Now, I'm not going to say I want to see that fella when I'm out hiking. I'm not saying I want to see him when, I, when I'm out at 3 in the morning taking my moonlight pee. I don't want to see him then, but I'm happy to see Travis's photos now. Wife, unbelievable job there as well. And and this one from Robert. We're going to wrap up our show today on this. It's absolutely fantastic. We invite you to talk at ryanjesperson.com to, to share your feel-good stories for positive reflections, including random acts of kindness. And this had me on the floor. This is amazing. Robert says, not long ago, I was driving with my 11-year-old, and I was talking to her about being grateful and giving back and how many people have been struggling through the course of this pandemic. So we stopped at Tim's to get a coffee, you know, an ice cap for her. And uh, I said, honey, let's pay for the order behind us to show some kindness. He said, I was sort of trying to set up a life lesson. So I got to the window and I said, I'll pay for the guy behind me too. And I handed her a fresh $20 bill. Pretty proud of myself, not going to lie. Uh, that's when the staffer told me that their order was $28. And at first I was like, who orders $28 at Timmy's? Realizing I didn't even have that much cash. So I started digging through my ashtray and I only had four fifty dollars in there. And then I had to ask my daughter, honey, do you have any money on you? And she said, I'm 11. Why would I have cash? <laughs> And so I had to crawl into the back of my SUV to get my credit card out of my jacket. I had to cover my bet. There was no way I could let that moment go or walk it back after taking such a strong moral position in front of my kid. We did get the honk and the wave from the surprised person behind us, which was great. My daughter thought it was hilarious. She immediately told her mom the moment we got home. Of course, their story focused on how frazzled I was. Robert says... Real talkers, stay safe and well. Sarah, welcome to the team. Great addition. That from Robert, the star or co-star of our Positive Reflections today. You can send in your Positive Reflections. We love stories like those to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Make sure you let us know in the subject line. It's a Positive Reflection for our Kubi Energy segment. Thanks for this, friends. We keep it real every morning. We gather here in community because we understand what the word means. One love. We'll talk to you tomorrow.